So Linnaeus is the father of taxonomy. He came up with a classification system, and uh, we re revere him today because of that. You know, he came up with kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and we still use that today, but we have, we've had to modify it and add to it. Um, but what he didn't do was classify according to evolutionary relationships. In other words, he didn't consider phylogeny. He based his classification mostly on external morphology, which means the outward appearance of organisms. Um, so if he were to consider the classification of these three species, um, which one of these two phylo phylogenetic trees do you think he would choose? Well, it turns out it would be this one. Between these possible phenotypes, he would have chosen this one because barnacles and lipids look so similar to each other in their outward appearance. Modern taxonomists rely on cladistic analysis, or cladistics, which is classifying organisms based on their evolutionary innovations, or shared derived characters, which are also known as synapomorphies. And that's what we're seeing in this cladogram. These uh, evolutionary innovations here, like the tiny, tiny free-swimming larva and segmentation and a, and a molted external skeleton, uh, those are the kind of derived characters that we're talking about. So based on cladistics, Linnaeus was wrong in this case because he didn't realize the evolutionary relationship indicated by these derived characters. Um, and there are also, well, the molted external skeleton is also known as an exoskeleton. So I want to introduce that term because we are going to be studying arthropods like crabs and barnacles. And so they all have an external skeleton, an exoskeleton. And they also have jointed appendages. But Linnaeus would not have considered that. He would have only considered their outward appearance, their general external morphology, and he would have classified them like this, more closely related to each other. And they have a similar lifestyle, too. They're both attached to rocks. Um, they both have to survive crashing waves. They both live in, like, the intertidal, where there are, there are, there's a lot of wave action. So they they took on this shape in order to survive those crashing waves and not be knocked off of rocks by crashing waves. But based on cladistics, they share all these other characteristics. Um, cra well, crabs and barnacles share all these other characteristics. So that s suggests strongly that crabs and barnacles are much more closely related to each other than barnacles and limpets are. So much so that crabs and barnacles are together in the phylum Arthropoda, and Arthropoda literally translates to jointed foot, jointed appendage, jointed foot. Um, and mollusks are a separate phylum, phylum mollusca. So two separate phylums within the kingdom Animalia. So limpets you can think of as being basically a snail with a different shape shell. You know, snails usually have that spiral shell. Well, limpets have a shell, that this conical shell. Um, but if you were to turn this limpet over and, and, and look at the underside, you would see something that looks like a snail living under that shell. Barnacles attach themselves to all kinds of things, and they feed by sending out their uh, appendages called cirri out into the water, and, and they capture little food particles and bring them in and, and feed on them with those appendages. But if you look closely at those appendages, they look very similar to the appendages of other arthropods. In other words, they are jointed uh, and they are covered with an exoskeleton. So Linnaeus went wrong, or his mistake is because of, or he was fooled really, by this concept of convergent evolution. In other words, the reason that barnacles and limpets have this similar outward appearance is not because they're closely related to each other, it's because they live in a similar niche. They live attached to rocks, they don't want to be blown off the rocks by crashing waves, so they've taken on this conical shape in order to be more hydrodynamic, and, and so that the, when, when the waves crash on them, they won't be pushed off, off of the rocks. So they are unrelated species that have evolved similar morphology, in other words, shape or form, because they've adapted to a similar habitat or niche. So that's also known as convergence. So the, the explanation for the similarity here is convergence or convergent evolution. So Linnaeus was right most of the time, however, 
um, you know, a lot of the things that Linnaeus classified, we still have the same classification today because extreme convergence like this is relatively rare. So most of the time, by looking at the external morphology of organisms, Linnaeus was able to classify them, you know, relatively correctly according to phylogenetic relationships. But he didn't know really that he was classifying them according to phylogenetic re relationships. So cladistic analysis or cladistics is based on this concept of a clade. That's why it's called cladistics. And so what is a clade? Well, it's a, it's a, what we also call a monophyletic group, which means there's only one common ancestor that gave rise to all these species that are, that are included in that group. So as I explained on the previous slide, cladistic analysis uses derived characters like segmentation and molded external skeletons, uh, which are also known as synapomorphies. So those are both vocabulary terms, but they're one and the same thing. Um, so they use those characteristics to inform common ancestry, in other words, to figure out who's related to who. So in this example, again, all arthropods have this, the same shared derived characters of segmentation and molting, um, and, and an exoskeleton and jointed appendages. And, the, and again, the jointed appendages are why we call arthropods arthropods. And the limpet over here is a mollusk, but the phylum name is, is mollusca. And, and by the way, mollusca means soft body. That's why most of them have a shell to protect their soft body. And note here that a shell is different than an exoskeleton. So when you mean an exoskeleton, don't call it a shell. In other words, this crab does not have a shell. It has an exoskeleton, which gets confusing because in everyday language, you can go to the restaurant and order soft shell crab, um, but it's not a shell. It's an exoskeleton. Mollusks are the one that have uh, true shells uh, from a biological standpoint anyway. And the material that makes them up are two totally different things too, but we're not going to get into that now. So in this case, um, the, a clade and the clade that has been determined to be the phylum arthropoda is what we would consider the in-group. In cladistic analysis, um, the in-group would be the clade that's being identified. And then the mollusks, mollusks would represent an out-group, a group that's not included in the in-group, right? And all other animal phyla would also, all other animal phyla besides arthropoda would be considered outgroups along with the phylum mollusca. And if you'll recall, there are approximately 35 different animal phyla in the animal kingdom. So they are all outgroups to the group arthropoda. All the other ones that are not arthropods are outgroups. But according to this cladogram, you'll notice that the tiny free swimming larva is shared not only by arthropods, but also mollusks. So really, uh, you could consider them to be in the same clade based on that derived character. That is a derived character. And based on that derived character, arthropods and mollusks would be included in the same clade. And they are in a more general sense. And that would be that they are all considered invertebrates, animals without backbones. So in the case of Arthophyllum arthropoda, the tiny free swimming larva would be considered what we call a primitive character not a derived character for the phylum arthropoda, but a primitive character that they share with other outgroups like phylum mollusca. So this is a cladogram, but what is a cladogram? Well, it's a branching diagram, as you can see, that shows the phylogenetic relationships between a number of different species. In other words, it's all, well, it's also known as a phylogenetic tree. And in a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree, branch points indicate common ancestry. So there is common ancestry between mollusks and arthropods, um, but there's closer common ancestry between the crab and the barnacle than there is between the crab and the limpet or the barnacle and the limpet. So where branches come together indicates common ancestry. So there's a common ancestor of all invertebrates including mollusks and arthropods, and there is a common ancestor of all arthropods, including crabs and barnacles. So how many clades are actually shown on this cladogram or phylogenetic tree? Well, if you'll recall, a clade has to be a monophyletic group. So arthropoda is a monophyletic group. There's a common ancestor of all arthropods.
Basically, you can also consider every branch on a phylogenetic tree or cladogram to be a clade also. So in other words, the crabs here represent a clade, the barnacles represent a clade, the limpet represents a clade, along with the other species that are closely related to limpets. And, you know, same with the barnacles. So there are a number, there are a lot of different species of barnacles, and they're all in the same clade uh, because there's common ancestry. That's why they're on the same branch. So knowing that, pause the video and think about it and see if you can come up with how many clades there are here and identify what they are. Did you come up with it? Well, you already know that Arthropoda is a clade. You already know that Mollusca is a clade. You also know that invertebrates, all, you know, this whole thing based on, you know, this tiny free swimming larva derived character here, the, the whole phylogenetic tree that we're looking at here uh, is a clade of invertebrates. So invertebrate animals, so that's one arthropoda, two phyla mollusca, <clears throat> uh, all in all the invertebrate animals, that's three. Um, and this this represents the same clade here on the on the phylogenetic tree we're looking at. This is actually the subphylum crustacea. So both barnacles and crabs are in the subphylum crustacea, but that's representing the same as phylum arthropoda on this cladogram. But we also have classes on this phylogenetic tree or cladogram. So we have the class Malacostraca, which are crabs, and we have class Cirripedio, which are barnacles, and we have class Gastropoda, which include limpets. So that's the five. Invertebrates, arthropods, and crustacea mollusks, Malacostraca, Cirripedia, and Gastropoda, uh, which is also represented by mollusks. So these are one and the same also. So just to clarify, invertebrates is one, Arthropoda, Crustacea is two, Mollusca, Gastropoda is three, Malacostraca is four, and Cirripedia would be five. And you can count them in a different order, but there are five. The final point here is that once a clade has been determined, it's up to the taxonomist as to whether or not that clade is going to be considered a taxon. Ideally, all taxa are clades, and all clades are taxa, ideally, but that's not the case. For example, there is no clade that includes all invertebrates. There is there is a clade, I'm sorry, there is no taxa that includes all invertebrates. Is that what I said? I don't know. Um, but that it that does represent a clade because there is a common ancestor of all invertebrate animals. Um, but it hasn't been considered to be a taxa. It hasn't, that clade is not considered by taxonomists to be a taxa. We refer to them as invertebrates, but invertebrates is not a domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, or species. We just, they're invertebrates. They're animals without a backbone. However, all the other clades that are represented by this phylogenetic tree have been considered to be, or have been um, accepted by taxonomists as being taxa, or assigned taxa uh, by taxonomists. And that's what the phylums and the subphylum and the classes are. Those are taxa. And I know that's confusing. That's why I had a hard time explaining it. Um, but the bottom line here is that clades are not necessarily, all clades are not necessarily taxa. However, that's the direction that we're working towards in the modern classification system is to finally have all clades be taxa and all taxa be clades. But we haven't achieved that yet. So the next question we're going to consider is how, how, how do we know how long ago species share common ancestry? In other words, how long ago, for example, did the class Malacostraca diverge from the class Cirripedia? When did that speciation, that divergence happen? Well, one way that we can do that is the fossil record, just looking back at the fossils. And, and it turns out that we're lucky that you know, barnacle fossils and crab fossils are pretty easy to find because they have hard parts that fossilize really well. But if we're talking about soft-bodied uh, species or species that don't have shells or exoskeletons, then uh, we're going to have a hard time. Um, 
So if species aren't represented well in the fossil record, we can rely on another method for determining how long ago species diverged um, by using what's known as a molecular clock. And DNA makes a good molecular clock. Comparisons of DNA sequences between species. We can use those to reconstruct phylogeny and, and to uh, create phylogenetic trees and cladograms based on these molecular clocks and how long ago it was that species diverged from each other. So the idea here is that the more similar the DNA, the more closely related two species are. And the less time it has been since they diverged from a common ancestor. And consider the opposite too. The less similar the DNA sequences are, the less closely related species are, and the longer ago they diverge from a common ancestor. And the basis for using DNA as a molecular clock relies on these uh, what we call neutral mutations. DNA mutates, right? The, the nucleotide sequence changes over time. And what, what neutral mutations are are mutations that don't make any difference to the survival of the organism. They're in non-coding coding sequences in DNA. In other words, they're not genes, right? If, if the DNA sequence, DNA sequences that don't code for proteins are not genes, and we call those non-coding sequences. And those are typically neutral um, in that if they mutate, that won't make any difference to the organism. And because they're neutral, they're not selected for. So they, they just go along for the ride. Um, there's no chance that they're going to be selected against and removed from the uh, genome of the organism that we're looking at, for example. So neutral mutations, just DNA that's going along for the ride, and if it changes, it doesn't matter. Um, but the significant thing here is that neutral mutations, the rate of neutral mutations is constant. You know, just like a, a, the running of a clock is constant. And that's the whole idea of a molecular clock. If you have changes that are taking place very consistently over time, you can use that as a clock. And these neutral mutations are changing very consistently over time. So the idea is to use that as a molecular, molecular clock to indicate how long ago it was that species diverged from each other um, or speciated. So as I mentioned, uh, gene mutations are the opposite of neutral mutations. Uh, they're protein coding sequences, so they can't be used for a molecular clock because they are subject to natural selection, and they can actually be removed by being selected against. They could be eventually removed from the genome of the organism that we're trying to uh, molecular clock. So this diagram is representing the accumulation of neutral mutations in non-coding in a non-coding DNA sequence, right? So this is a neutral gene in an ancestral species. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and make a scenario out of this where we're going to consider this to be a sequence, a neutral sequence in the DNA of a chimp bonobo human ancestor, because there is close ancestry common ancestry between humans and chimps and bonobos. And we are actually more closely, closely related to bonobos than we are to chimps. So these arrows represent divergence, a split, a split, <coughs> a split in populations. Um, and once the populations split, once the populations diverge or the, or the uh, species diverge, they become different from each other. They're, they're, they're free to mutate and become different from each other. And so that's what this represents. We have two mutations in this line, and we have two mutations in this line, and these lines are now evolving separate from each other. So divergence and speciation is taking place here. And the idea is that maybe this is the human ancestor. In other words, this is the origin of the genus Homo, for example. And again, I just made up this scenario. This isn't factual at all. So please don't consider it factual. Um, but in my example, this would be uh, the genus Homo coming into existence. And likewise, the chimp bonobo ancestor here would be the emergence of the genus Pan, uh, because that's the genus that both bonobos and chimpanzees are uh, members of or a part of. Then we have another divergence event um, and populations or species that are now spe uh, evolving separately and speciation becoming different from each other. Um, and so by the time we get to the end of our scenario here, we have three species. We've got pan troglodytes, which are chimpanzees, 
We have pan paniscus, which are bonobos, and we have pan, or I'm sorry, pan. We have homo sapiens, which are human beings. Now, it's important to note in understanding how this works that you notice here that we have the same, uh, the accumulation of the same number of different mutations over the same time. Yeah, these mutations are different in all of the divergence and speciation that's gone on. These species are evolving different mutations, but there's the same number of mutations. In other words, in this time period, there were two mutations, and then in this time period, there was an additional mutation. And so all three species have the same number of mutations in this same neutral sequence of DNA. So if we know the mutation rate, then simply all we have to do is multiply the mutation rate by the number of mutations. So again, this is completely fictional. I, I just made this up, this scenario up. But let's say, for example, the mutation rate is one mutation every 1.8 million years, right? So then we multiply 1.8 million years by three because there have been three mutations that have accumulated in this sequence of neutral, neutral DNA sequence here. Um, so that would be about 5.6 million years. In other words, the idea is that we can compare the DNA sequences here between Homo sapiens and Pan paniscus and Pan troglodytes. And from that information, we know that these species had a common ancestor that lived 5.6 million years ago. And by the way, that number is approximately right. In other words, that's the estimate of when the chimp bonobo human ancestor diverged. So I made up this scenario which, which and this number, this mutation rate, but this time uh, is uh, the current estimate. And on a final note concerning molecular clocks, DNA isn't the only thing that has a sequence that can be used uh, for molecular uh, as a molecular clock. If you'll recall, proteins are polypeptides. They, ha they have uh, an amino acid sequence that can also be used as a molecular clock. So amino acid sequences and proteins uh, can be compared between species and used as a molecular clock also.